Hello, Seahawk fans. Welcome to another episode of the Hawk's Nest. Well, the sun is out. The birds are tweeting. Training camp is in full swing. Let's dive on into some Seahawk news, shall we? The Seahawks got some great news right out the beginning of training camp when Bobby Wagner signed a contract extension with the team, thus effectively making him, for the most part, a Seahawk for life. Now, this is a great deal for both the player and the team. The player gets to claim he is now the highest paid middle linebacker in the game, beating out C.J. Mosley's deal that was signed over the last offseason at $18 million per Well, Seahawk management actually gets to claim a win on this as well, because while it is widely reported that he's making $18 million per season on the new contract, people aren't really factoring in that final year that still remains on his current deal, which had no bonus money remaining on it, so only the base was there. What this allows Seattle to do is kind of massage some of that bonus money out a little bit, and so rather than it being up at the $18 million per year, it's actually down in that $13 to $14 million range. And this is important because Seahawks management was able to do the very same thing with Russell Wilson, where it was widely reported that he was making $35 million per season. In actuality, because it was an extension based off the prior deal, it was down in the more of the 32, 33000000 million-ish mark. Now, it's only a couple million dollars here that we're talking about, but it all adds up when we're talking about the salary cap. And as we saw with the Super Bowl teams, it can get tight really quickly when you start getting good players. So it's great to have that kind of flexibility. As well, this helps us moving into next year with Jaron Reed's negotiations because now he's really the only player that you would potentially target with that franchise tag. If Bobby was still on the team, you're probably automatically moving it to him, and now you've got the potential of losing Jaron Reed. Now we sign Bobby. Now we can use that franchise tag potentially on Jaron Reed if they can't get a contract extension done with him. So it helps in that respect too. So a great deal for Bobby, a great deal for management. Again, Schneider just is continuing to kill it over about the last 18 months or so. So love it. Okay, so now we've reached the part of the episode where I've got to eat a little bit of crow. I did a draft preview of the Seahawks as we were leading into the draft where I was looking at who I thought they'd be drafting and I was specifically targeting the wide receiver position and looking at what they've picked at prior and seeing the measurements and seeing what they look for in athleticism. I tried to make a prediction about the receivers I thought they would take in this draft because I did think Seattle was going to take a wide receiver within the first three rounds. Now, I was right about that, but the two receivers I took right off the top of the list were Hollywood Brown, Antonio Brown's cousin, and DK Metcalf. Now, I didn't remove DK because he didn't fit the physical measurements that the Seahawks have looked for in receivers in the past. He hit pretty much all the measurements that they look for. Size, length, explosiveness, speed, all that stuff was right there. Where I didn't think Seattle was going to pick him, though, was that every pundit that I looked at, everywhere I looked at as far as mock drafts and all that you were hearing was that he was definitely going to go in the first round and most likely within the top first 20 picks. So it was just hard for me to see Schneider going after receiver in the first round when he they were so adamant and seemed so driven to get a defensive lineman no matter what. And this was proven out, of course, because we took like the 16th defensive lineman uh, that was taken in the first round at the end of the first round. So it was definitely a position they seemed to be targeting. I just didn't think they were going to take DK there. He falls through the draft, just keeps slipping and sliding on through. We end up getting him at the last pick in the second round. So from a value standpoint, it's amazing. I, I, I think you're getting a guy that's almost the first pick of the third round, essentially, versus getting him in the top 20. And if I had known that he would have been available there at that point, I certainly would have said that he's eligible for Seattle to be picking at that point, and I'd certainly look at them to target him even. But it was just such a shocker. Either way, I don't mind eating crow on this because I'm hugely excited for this guy's potential. The reports from camp have been sensational. He looks like the real deal. I'm not predicting Calvin Calvin Johnson or Julio Jones type, but even if we get a receiver this year who can come in and give you six, 700 yards receiving, six to eight touchdowns, that could have a very big impact on this offense where we're going to run the ball very well. We're not going to need a lot of yards in the air. We're just going to need them when we need them. You know what I mean? So, I'll eat the crow on this one. I did not see the DK pick coming, but I'm happy to eat it. Happy. The next big story that's kind of coming out of training camp and has everybody's uh, worries up has got to be the defensive line situation. 
Of course, Jaron Reed, it's been announced, is going to have to serve a six-game suspension for violating the league's conduct policy. And Seattle was already paper thin at the defensive line as it was. Certainly bringing in Ziggy Ansaw was going to help, but he's had an injury history. It appears he's going to be available for the first game of the season, but it still is very, very thin there. So it was even worse than when we got to hear that LJ Collar essentially got, I don't know if it's a high ankle sprain, a foot strain, whatever it is, it appears to be something that's going to keep him out of action for a minimum of eight weeks, at least a couple weeks into the regular season. And for those of you out there that want to then jump on the boat of say, well, the second he comes back, he's going to instantly be able to make an impact. There's a long history of rookies throughout the league that when they get these high ankle sprains early on, it nags at them throughout the year. They can't become the full of what they could be. And already with defensive end, you see it as a position that tends to be a development one, being that guys don't tend to just come right out of the draft, able to rush the passer and be really good at that. It takes something that takes a little while to develop. And I wouldn't necessarily expect that to come right out the gate with LJ when he does return. This is a bit of a concern for me now, and this is sort of going to lead into where my next point is, and that is tempered expectations for the season. With this defensive line depth, I'm, I'm starting to get into a struggling place where I don't know if we can necessarily make the playoffs. And stay with me with this for just a second. The Seahawks blitz least than any amount in the team. Carroll hates to blitz. He hates to leave his, his cornerbacks out there without the help. He, just, he doesn't like to do it. And that's okay. That's fine. It's a defensive scheme. They've gotten to a Super Bowl by running this kind of scheme. But the problem with that scheme is that then those front four guys have to get to the quarterback. You've got to have quality guys on that line that can get there, to get there and be a factor. Because if you've got this guy doesn't really rush the passer and that guy doesn't really rush the passer, and then we've got two guys here that we're hoping one of these two guys can get home, we've seen in the past what that leads to is a drop-off in sacks, a drop-off in pressures, and you get a defense that's just picked apart. You bring a, a veteran quarterback in, say a, a Phillip Rivers or a Drew Brees type that comes in, and they will just dink and dunk the heck out of you all day, take what you're giving them, and you'll not be able to get to that quarterback. We're reaching into that place right now where outside of getting some sensational development from Jacob Martin or Rasheem Green, we're going to not be getting very much pass rush on the quarterback. And this is not the same secondary that we had under the Legion of Boom. So to expect them to be able to hold up back there for a longer period of time when these guys aren't getting the pressure, it, it's making me struggle to see this team able to get into a position to really push for a division title, let's say. Or if we are to push for a division title, it's because the rest of the, you know, the divisions come back down to earth, being the Rams aren't as good as they were last year, and it's kind of just a dog fight. But you can't have this defense without having some dogs on that defensive line. It just doesn't work. If you were a blitz team, that's you could you could cover up for some of this. And I've got friends that like to tell me, oh, we're going to become more blitzing with the linebackers. Bobby Wagner is going to come more on the blitzes. And that's all well and good, but you could blitz 10% more of the time as a team on defense, and you'd still blitz the least amount of any team in the league. It's just not in Carroll's uh, DNA to do it. And to expect him to suddenly understand how to be a blitz-heavy scheme when he's been a read and react kind of zone scheme for the most the majority of his coaching career, I think it's a huge leap. Now, somebody could come in and develop. Maybe there's somebody shocks the heck out of us, like Shaquem, Shaquem Griffith, who comes in and suddenly becomes a, a, a decent pass rusher like he was in college. But without that pass rush, this defense does not work. You can have great linebackers, you can have great secondary, but that front four has got to get home. You give any quarterback four, five, six seconds to throw the ball, they will find an open receiver. So don't get the cart before the horse. We've got to get that defensive line before we get these other parts. And that's the one place where I think this team's gotten a little bit skewed on. They've put some resources into it. We've got Puna Ford's good. Ziggy could be good. We're going to get back uh, Jaron Reed. There are some interesting develop developmental guys on the line, and this could end up becoming something that's no issue at the end of the day. But right now it's a big problem and one worth continuing to monitor as the season goes on. All right, so on the final item of the docket today, I'm going to get a little geeky on you guys. Okay, we're going to look at the Seattle Seahawks salary cap situation. And specifically, as it forecasts into next off season, Because John Snyder and Pete Carroll have positioned things very nicely for them to be able to go into next off season and hit that NAS button on their car and go firing to the front of the pack, hopefully to again be a Super Bowl contending team. 
And when you look at it, Seattle's due to have about $55 million in salary cap space as we move into next offseason. That's even with the Bobby Wagner contract extension that he just signed. Now, you're going to have to do something with Jaron Reed as far as a franchise or an extension goes there. But even still, once you do that, you should still be in the neighborhood of about $42 million or so to go out and spend on that open market. And this is really important because Schneider hasn't had any money to spend out on the open market in about five years. They've had a lot of their own great players that they've retained over that time period, which has been both a good and a bad thing. It's good to retain the players and keep them in. But it was bad in the respect that a lot of these guys that you sign contract extensions to. Uh, Marshawn Lynch, Cliff Averill, uh, Michael Bennett, uh, Cam Chancellor, even this year Doug Baldwin. They all ended up either leaving the team or retiring prematurely, and so you had to end, end up taking that bonus money and having it all accelerated into one year. This has created dead money year after year after year during our Super Bowl run. Even this year, we still are going to have Doug Baldwin's dead money sitting on our cap. But moving into next offseason, all that dead money finally goes away. And this is one of the reasons that you have so much cap space to go out there and then spend. So we've got a huge bundle of draft picks. We've got a huge amount of cap space. And we don't have really any of our own free agents that we have to sign. So, yeah, so Seattle's going to be in a great position to really, really target the right guys that they want to bring in to fill in those holes that might develop because you're hoping that your developmental players are going to take the next step in a couple of places and then you can just target where you need and then become that team that we're all hoping for them to return and become once again. So while I do have some tempered expectations for this season, specifically just because of the defensive line depth and quality, I think that they're still in that prime position to get them right back to the mountaintop. So get excited not only about this team, but get excited about the future of the team because things are looking very, very rosy. All right, that about wraps it up for us today. I'm going to try to get these out a little bit more consistently to you guys. I've been out enjoying the sunshine in the summer. And let's face it, when you live in Washington, you better get out and enjoy the summer because you're going to be due for nine months of dreariness just right around the corner. I want to say that I really do appreciate all of the support that I've received from you guys since we started this channel back in February. I've just crossed over 250 subscribers. The comments, the suggestions have been just great. If you have any uh, suggestions for improvement, please do leave it down there in the comments section. I'm working on a next great Seahawk Moments video. It's going to be the Seahawks and 49ers championship game, a true bloodbath from a couple years ago. I really do appreciate you guys liking, subscribing, and commenting, all that. And please don't ever forget, don't ever, ever forget, go Hawks.